not Chicago, KGT. Born and raised in KGT. So uh, I, although I moved from KGT, I'm no longer there, but it is um, kind of nostalgic coming, coming back down here. I used to come out here when I was uh, little, you know, in, the, in the early 90s. From friends, and it's been many years since I came back here. Uh, last time I came was, I think it was in a spring camp. The MSA was a yearly spring camp, so about four or five years ago. I attended that. So definitely I'm, I am uh, excited to be here, and I appreciate and thank the MSA along with the Asian American Cultural Center for uh, having invited me uh, today for this uh, inaugural program for the semester. And uh, the topic that was um, given to me, the pursuit of happiness, I think is a very relevant, important topic for, for everyone. And uh, that is something definitely um, that is the greatest obje objective, not for some or few or students, but rather uh, the greatest objective for humanity, uh, for most part. But at the same time, it's one of the most elusive objectives, too. It seems to be something which is becoming more difficult to grab, more difficult to gain, more difficult to attain. So there are many ways to um, approaching this topic uh, being uh, uh, an Islamic scholar um, and uh, someone who studies theology, Islamic theology, in which he spends his days and uh, nights teaching um, Islamic theology. But, you know, I would like to share an Islamic perspective uh, on happiness, something which doesn't necessarily have to um, be, uh, you know, a, a person of Islamic faith to put that into practice, but rather anyone from any faith can look at that perspective and take from it whatever beneficial things that they find in it. And uh, hopefully, you know, uh, can definitely add at least a few degrees of happiness to their current life. Um, so just coming down here, just thinking about some ideas of speaking to my students who are with me, uh, college students in the car, I was discussing this and I realized that really, you know, as young men and women uh, in a very stressful environment of the university where you are trying to earn your engineering degree or your medical degree or whatever the case may be, uh, you have so much going on, so many deadlines to meet, and then you've got social engagements that you have, uh, and then along with that you have far away your parents and your siblings and maybe your relatives and so forth, also who have expectations from you, who, uh, who uh, you need to keep in touch with and take care of them. And then along with that, uh, simply your <coughs> physical well-being, your, your uh, health, all of those factors are playing in, and the person feels overwhelmed. Every single semester we start off with, alright, this semester is going to be different. We're going to make this a really amazing semester. We're going to be on top of our game, not only just in our grades, uh, uh, and scholastically speaking, but beyond that as well. I'm going to make sure my weekends are well spent and, and, and um, I'm involved in various you know, charities or uh, various other um, uh, off-campus activities that might be of some benefit to humanity. So we have all these grand um, plans every semester and every year. And some... Uh, you know, thank God, are able to achieve that and are able to definitely have a very productive time at university. But for others, really, it just becomes uh, a part of their life, which they will look back, unfortunately, years later and say, well, what in the world was I doing? Well, what was I doing? I had that amazing opportunity in those years at university. I was talented, I was young, I was strong, I had so much energy. And what did I do with all that that I was given? So you have both types of people. <clears throat> people who really make the most of it and people who will waste it away. So, all of us probably have taken a, a, a class or two in anthropology of psychology and the liberal arts and discussed the, um, the needs of the human being as discussed by the psychologist. And we've definitely talked about happiness there as well. And what happiness means and how we can measure happiness. We've all read the stats on which countries the inhabitants have ranked to be the most happiest in the world. And surprisingly, you know, we have uh, countries that don't rank very well, even though they have a lot of the things. They have a, a lot of the material things. They have a lot of uh, uh, wealth, and they have a lot of uh, power and fame and stuff, but yet they don't seem to be ranking too well in the terms of happiness. So you've read that, you've heard about it, I'm sure you've discussed it. I want to mention today that our faith and our religion teaches us, and for not, not only Islam, but many, many, many other faiths, and the Eastern tradi traditions have uh, uh, an emphasis on this as well. That happiness is both from the body and the soul. That the human being is comprised of the soul and the body together. However, the soul takes precedence over the body. Because the body is a mere mode of transportation. 
It's a conveyance. And the soul is the passenger. So in order to get from home to here, many of you boarded, uh, got into your friend's car, your parent's car, and you went to the train station. And from there, you went on to uh, uh, train, uh, arrive at a certain location. From there, you possibly took a bus, and you came to a, uh, the nearest bus stop, and then from there, you walked home, walked to your apartment. That same individual, Adam, he didn't change, but simply the conveyance has changed. He was in his parents' car, and then he got into the train, then he got into the bus, and then he himself walked, walked to his apartment. And all along, you have to differentiate that there's one's Adam and one's Adam's car. One's Adam and one's Adam's bus. One is Adam and one's Adam's seat in a train coming down out of here. If a person gives more importance and preference to the seat, to the car, to the bicycle, uh, to the mode of conveyance, they're definitely in big trouble. If all the energy and the focus, and you don't even say hi, bye to the person, you're always just waving at the car, looking at the car, vacuuming the car, polishing the car, and trying to see if it needs anything, and leaving the man who's driving the car, who's the passenger of the car, you absolutely have no regards for his needs, no regards for his feelings, we're definitely in the wrong place. That's not how we're supposed to approach people. You have to understand that a man who's uh, uh, driving the car is the most important aspect of it. Although without the car, he would have never reached here. But the car is secondary. The primary is the person who's driving. Very similar to that is the belief that the soul is the most important aspect. And the soul, our Islamic theology teaches us, was been there for a long, long, long time. Before God created the heavens and the earth. Of course, I'm speaking going to repeat from an Islamic theological perspective, which not everyone has to agree to that, but this is the premise of speaking from an Islamic perspective, which other religions, many religions do share, uh, is that before God created the heavens and the earth, He created souls. Every soul that is sitting in this room. And then after this world was created, and at a given period of time when God intended the soul to come into this world, which had already been previously created, the inception is what we call it, took place, and the, the, the child is formed in the, in the mother's womb, and, um, and eventually comes into this world, and before it comes into this world, the soul is blown into the body, four months. And so when the child comes out and into this world, you have two things now. You have a body, which was newly created, formed about four months, uh, nine months ago, and a soul which has been there for thousands and millions of years, God knows how many years. The soul was there before that body, the soul was there in the womb, the soul is there in this, in this world, and very soon, after 70, 80, 90, 100 years, the body will die, as we call it, and death is simply the separation of the soul from the body. That's it, the soul never dies. The soul doesn't die, that's our belief. The soul doesn't die, the soul separates from the body, and the body is laid into the ground, and over three, four days, or a period of time, disintegrates depending on where it's buried. Gone, dead. But our belief is that the soul lives much longer than that, way beyond that. The body is gone, but the soul is still there. So when people have visions, when people feel the presence, when people feel someone's communicating with them, you know, for us, that's not something where you need to call in the Ghostbusters. You know, this is reality. This is something we believe in. That there is definitely a connection between the other world and this world, between the souls of the, of the ones who passed and the current souls who are in here. And then eventually, we believe, very important, is the coming of a new life, the hereafter, uh, a day of resurrection, the day of judgment, a day where everyone will face not only God, but his own deeds, his or her own deeds, will come face to face with his or her own life, their actions and their decisions that they made. And on that day, the soul will be placed back into every single body, even the bodies that were cremated, even the bodies that were eaten up by a shark, even the bodies that were eaten up by a lion of a jungle, the bodies that have been disintegrated, Someone will say, how? And the Quran <coughs> constantly addresses this question because the Arabs to whom the Prophet Muhammad was sent, peace and blessings be upon him, always had an issue. They believed in God. But they said, a next life, another life, after we're dead, we're going to get raised? Ah, we can't believe that. Because the bodies are disintegrated. They're bones, they're dead bones. How are we supposed to come back? How are they supposed to come back to life? And the Quran constantly says, listen, you at least got bones here. You've got some, you know, some, some tissue left over it. You are thinking, how, how will life come back to this tissue and these decayed bones? What about your inception and your coming into this world? There was no bones. There was no raw materials. There was nothing at all. You came out of nowhere. 
But God created you out of nowhere, thin air, you know, there's a man and woman, there's nothing going on. All of a sudden, now you have a child who's like eight pounds, subhanAllah, you know, glory to be to God. He's got eyes, got ears, can listen, can hear, can, can move his hands, can, can make noise. Where did this come out of thin air? So if God is able to bring uh, a living human being, or for that matter, a mammal of any sort, into, uh, into this world out of thin air, apparently, then to bring back life to some decayed bones, based even on your own logic, it should be easier. So when that soul will come back, then our belief is there will be judgment. A person faces, faces retribution or reward for his or her actions. And then, of course, there's paradise and there's hell for based on a person's actions. Why I mention all of this is the fact that for us, the emphasis must be on the happiness or the lack thereof, the soul. Because the body is only here for 70, 80, 90 years at most. The soul was there from before and shall remain for eternity. If the soul is happy here, hopefully it will be happy there as well. If the soul is unkept, untaken care of, spiritually speaking, then not only will it be deprived here, but more importantly, it will be deprived in the next life. So that is why the emphasis of our faith teaches us that you and I have to focus on the enrichment of the soul, along with, of course, enrichment of the body. So they are interlaced and interconnected. The happiness of the soul definitely does come through, we're not denying that, by serving the body to a certain extent. Meaning, a person who is completely deprived from nutrition, hasn't eaten for, you know, six days, three days, or suffering poverty and, and hunger, I'm sure he will feel a little pain spiritually and uh, feel a little down because he hasn't gotten any food. Similarly, a person who hasn't rested, a person who uh, his basic biological needs are not being fulfilled, basic psychological needs, emotional needs of love, of respect, of a sense of belonging. When those things are not fulfilled, definitely the soul does take a hit, but to only a certain degree. The rest of it is actually what we call soul food, food for thought, right? We're talking here, food for thought, we'll talk about food. In the soul food, soul food has really uh, changed a lot in, its, in what it means. Soul food, I'm talking about real nutrition for the spirit. Where you feel spiritually happy and spiritually connected and you have a purpose and a mission in life. This seems to be the biggest problem right now. While driving out of the air, I saw so many students. It's a beautiful sight, of course. Coming out of one building, going to the next, and coming out from one, going to the next, and you just, this classes are ending and starting. You go to downtown Chicago, you go to downtown New York, go to any metropolitan city, and you'll see lunch hour, 8 o'clock, people coming out of the train, going to the buildings, coming out, carrying their briefcases, running. I always think of stopping my car and say, stop and say, hey, where are you headed? Well, I got a meeting, a 12 o'clock meeting to attend. I got a 12.30 class today. Okay, uh, fine, but if you can give me a minute and tell me, where are you headed in life? Where are you headed in life? What's your end goal of life? What's your mission and purpose you live and you die for? I probably will get some startled glances, uh, doubts that really, is that what you stop me to ask me? Or are they asking for directions? But brother, this, or a sister, this is way more important than my directions that you should know the answer to this. If there's a person aimlessly walking back and forth 10, 15 times, you might go check him out, and if he doesn't give you a favorable response, you'll call campus security. What did he do wrong? He just walked 20 times from one end of the building to the other, aimlessly. This is not right. You're not allowed to walk aimlessly around a place, my apartment, for uh, 20 minutes. There's got to be something wrong with you. Well, what about a person who aimlessly lives his life for 60 years? And you ask him, where are you headed? What are you doing? He always gives you the next milestone. For example, driving down 57, you're up by exit what, 320. Where are you headed, man? I'm on the way to exit 327. Okay, I'll meet you at 327. You meet him at exit 327. 